happy you're all here. My name is Anthony Cimolino. I'm the artistic director of the Stratford Festival. And I want to welcome you to one of the first Stratford Festival forums of this, given, of this current season. And for, for those of you who don't know, the forum is a series of engaging, uh, interactive events that take place throughout our season. And they're designed to illuminate the themes, the ideas that are inherent in our playbill and in each one of these plays. So let me tell you a little bit about today's event. Martha de Henry has directed a very powerful, a very moving production of Mother Courage and her children in our season, which really looks at the costs of war on the participants, both the civilians, the, the uh, soldiers, and the story is quite gripping. Her eldest son, Mother Courage's eldest son, is recruited, and he is ultimately betrayed by the same commander that he fought for. Her second boy is hunted down and he's sacrificed for money. Her daughter survives a mutilation only to be killed when she heroically tries to save civilians in the climactic scene of the play. And in preparation for this production, Martha Henry um, spent a lot of time ruminating about what are the contemporary parallels to these equivalents, to these situations. What are the fates and, and the uh, the trials of the soldiers and civilians in war-torn areas around the world. And so, we decided that we would convene a panel to give voice and to give depth to those people in those situations. And when we started to think about our dream team of who we want here today, we never dared to think that we could get all of these terrific people on the same day here at Stratford. But sometimes in life, you get lucky, and ladies and gentlemen, this morning, we've got lucky. Dr. Isaldina Boulesh, despite unbelievable personal hardship, including the loss of three of his daughters when their home was destroyed by Israeli forces, has become one of the world's most vocal proponents for peace in the Middle East through his foundation, Daughters for Life. Romeo Dallaire is probably the most prominent advocate for support for veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder. Following his own experience with the disease, serving <coughs> after serving as force commander for the UN, uh, assistance mission for Rwanda in 93 and 94. And Dr. Samantha Nutt uh, began her career as a physician in war zones and has dedicated her life to the war-afflicted women and children through her foundation, War Child Canada. It is an honor to have them with us today. Um, this event is being live streamed, ladies and gentlemen, so when we get to the Q&A portion, we will have a mic for you that's very important for people around the world to be able to take in the nature of the event that's uh, happening here today. We have about a dozen live streams planned among our foreign forum events this year, and so we ask you, if you'd like to learn more about it, just go to our website, stratfordfestival.ca, and see what else is coming up. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce our moderator, CBC producer, and award-winning documentary maker, Karen Wells. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Stratford, for um, a phenomenal season, as ever, and for this forum. It, uh, it's really... An, delightful asset to all that we come to Stratford for. It's my great pleasure to properly, formally introduce our panel. Um, you've heard Anthony mention who these people are. Isaldine Aboesh, Dr. Aboesh was born and grew up in the Jabalia refugee camp in the northern part of Gaza. Gaza is that narrow strip of land that is repeatedly called the largest prison in the world. At the same time, Gaza is a throbbing community, a huge community, throbbing with, with vitality, with passion, and both anger and sorrow. His family grew up in dire poverty, ate from the same plate. There was barely enough food, but there were schools, and he went through school to use uh, an old-fashioned term, he applied himself. He was somewhat lucky because he became one of a handful of doctors to emerge from that particular refugee camp. He worked at uh, a hospital in Israel, made uh, good colleagues and, and friends of many Israelis, and he completed a residency in obstetrics and gynecology while going back and forth between Gaza and Israel, I mean, 
twice a day. Sometimes it was an, an incredibly difficult thing to do. He built a career, he built a family, he worked internationally. Then on January the 16th, 2009, during the prolonged Israeli assault on Gaza, his house was fired upon, three of his daughters and his niece were killed. Subsequently, Dr. Abu El Esh wrote a book called I Shall Not Hate. He established a foundation in memory of those young women. He moved to Toronto with the help of Toronto colleagues and others. And in 2010, he was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. So, is Odin Aboyesh our first panelist? Do please come up. second chapter of her book, which is called Damn Nations, Greed, Guns, Armies, and Aid, she quotes the colonel in MASH talking to Hawkeye and saying, there are certain rules about war. Number one is that young men die, and number two is the doctors can't change rule number one. But uh, they can do a damn good job trying, and that's part of what she has been around, uh, uh, about. As a friend of hers said to me earlier this week, Sam's worked in every hell hole in the world. She uh, herself it describes herself as not a life-saving kind of physician. She doesn't sew limbs back on. Rather, she's a, a public health doctor whose interest has been in the health of women and children in particular. She started out bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, if you like, and fresh out of medical school, she went to Somalia to work for UNICEF. That was in 95. Um, and she says, too, she was full of naive optimism at that point about what she could do. She also uh, sent out, at that time, a stream of postcards posted from post data, post posted, if you like, from the Nairobi airport to her parents who thought she was uh, on safari in Kenya. She just didn't bother to mention where she was going. And uh, she has through, uh, thought long and hard about all of this. She has established a Canadian foundation called War Child to enhance hope and dignity for kids in particular. And she continues to work in this area. Samantha Nutt. something that the people have difficulty putting together. He has become a humanitarian, and that's hard to reconcile with the notion of a military man for some people. He's a rigorous humanitarian. Most people do not think that the two go together. He's known first and foremost to most of us as commander of the UN troops in Rwanda of a small contingent charged with protecting 30,000 people seeking refuge from the genocide that ultimately killed 800,000. His repeated calls for reinforcement went unanswered. Those days cost General Dallaire his mental health, which he has spoken about. He has become an advocate for those suffering from the injury of post-traumatic stress disorder. And he also he defied the stigma in talking about it, which um, was something quite phenomenal. In 2005, he was appointed to the Senate, from which he has just resigned, to pursue um, international work. Senate has not been such a productive place to work lately. Uh, and he will be continuing his international work on his child soldier initiative, which has been consuming a great deal of his time. Why are there child soldiers, and what can be done to stop that? Senator Dallaire.
So we're going to begin with a few remarks from each of our panelists, and I will call upon, now I've forgotten what order we decided to go in, so I may get it wrong, you'll forgive me. Um, I'm going to start with, with Senator Delaire. Well, let's start with the general. <laughs> who, who's going to do more important things or more active things than what he was doing in the Senate, I gather? Is that what it was said? <laughs> um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you for defying your uh, duties in the church to come here this morning <laughs> and to listen to a few of us preach, maybe. Uh, but uh, I am uh, most flattered to come and speak. Um, on the subject of war and the impact it has on human beings, um, and in particular those who, who serve uh, in uniform, as well as those who serve outside of uniform, and in more particularly those who end up by being victims. To set the scene, and we only have a few minutes, and I must warn you that brevity is not my strength. I, I, <laughs> We, we have stumbled into a, a new era when we speak of war. Um, with the, the old classic big armies uh, facing each other in, in Europe uh, or in other such locations, uh, apart from maybe the 1991 first Gulf War, uh, that type of, of uh, nation to nation or alliances to alliances, wars, uh, that, that stuff is over. And what we stumbled into is an era of imploding nations and failing states uh, and civil wars in which uh, it is no more the vast numbers of military professionals or uh, conscripted that are actually doing the fighting and the dying for whatever cause they may have had. Uh, we are now seeing the civilian population being not only the target but also the prize for in civil wars, uh, the uh, focus is on the civilian population to have them on your side or, uh, depending on the nature of that conflict, uh, be the ultimate aim or the target. The Rwandan genocide is one such example of ongoing civil wars uh, from Central African Republic to Mali to Syria and so on, uh, where, in fact, the aim was uh, one group wanted to maintain power and decided that the only way to do that uh, and to guarantee it uh, was to wipe out the other group and to proceed in trying to kill 1.2 million people of all ages and succeeded in slaughtering over 700,000 of them. And so uh, these civil wars have a whole different construct uh, in how uh, we react to them and the impact they have on the people. But in the civil wars, two new horrific weapons have been introduced uh, in order to uh, express the absolute uh, horror and the extremism uh, uh, to what extent uh, people will go to achieve their aim. And what I mean in the two examples is one is the use of children as a primary weapon of war, and the other one is rape. Uh, and the impacts uh, of those on, on uh, those who are uh, hopefully attempting to uh, curtail these conflicts and even stop them, and I'll come to that and the impact of that very rapidly. The first one I want to talk about uh, is, is the use of rape as an instrument to create horror, to de deconstruct the social uh, uh, body that's out there, uh, to instill fear, and once they've got fear in the population, uh, then uh, the people who are uh, conducting the conflict uh, can gain control of the population and then move millions. In Rwanda, they moved 3.9 million people uh, after slaughtering ultimately close to uh, a million, either directly or through the diseases. So uh, the use of, of rape uh, is a deliberate action uh, being employed uh, in order to instill that ultimate horror and fear to gain control on the population and to subsume them into their uh, camp, one, uh, either willingly or certainly unwillingly. Uh, it's gone to such a sophistication that in, in Darfur, the 
Janjaweed militias uh, were actually raping African Darfurian Sudanese women in order to create another race uh, as uh, their Arab based uh, Darfurians uh, and Sudanese uh, were not at all uh, at, at ease with the African base. So, I mean, it could go to that level, including using uh, prisoners who are um, uh, infected with HIV AIDS and use them uh, to rape in order to uh, spread the disease amongst the group. So that is a, a most horrific dimension that is deliberately used. And so finally, the International Criminal Court has recognized it as a crime against humanity, uh, as it's considered torture. Uh, and uh, from the Rwandan genocide, there were uh, a few people who were, uh, in fact, uh, uh, put away for life for uh, ordering and organizing uh, deliberate rape sites and the like. The other uh, dimension is the introduction, uh, mostly in the late 80s, uh, of children from eight, nine years old, uh, right through to what the optional protocol pushes to the age of 18, uh, as the, my, and the main primary uh, instrument of conflict. Uh, and so uh, by drugging them up, uh, abusing them, uh, molesting them, uh, threatening them, uh, killing and maiming some of them, uh, they are uh, employing anywhere between 200 and 250,000 of these kids at any one time in close to 30 conflicts around the world. And right now, as an example, in, in uh, both South Sudan but in, in Central African Republic, they're recruiting the vast numbers of children, as they did in, in the Mali conflict. Uh, this is the most sophisticated low technology weapon system in the inventory now because it covers the whole spectrum, everything from up front doing the horrible exactations to in many of these male dominated societies, uh, the women running all the logistics, the bivouacs, the water, the food, the materials and so on. Uh, and also the girls because 40% of child soldiers are girls, uh, they're used as sex slaves and bushwives. So it's an end-to-end -end system, and with the demographics of those countries where such a humongous proportion of the population is under 15, there's lots of them. There's lots of proliferation of small arms so that you can arm them if you need be, uh, and so it is a never-ending source. And this has now moved to a significant capability uh, that is a preferred option than going after and trying to convince adults to fight. Uh, the impact, however, uh, on the children is, is humongous uh, on the boys as well as the girls and uh, work has been done over the years and uh, Samantha's team has been instrumental in that with others in the rehabilitation and reintegration. The work I'm doing is trying to try to stop them being recruited and uh, try to introduce new instruments so that uh, belligerents uh, or even the peacekeepers coming in don't simply consider them as uh, fair game belligerents and use lethal force. We're trying to bring in a whole new construct of tactics and weapons and so on to stop killing these children who ultimately kill. I'll conclude with the following uh, two very fast examples. Uh, first one is um, a, a corporal that I know well who's been on a number of UN missions and uh, was uh, in fact in the Rwandan mission. And uh, he is uh, not unusual, he is reflective of the injury, uh, operational stress injury we call PTSD, uh, and uh, what uh, the World War II vets who were there for D-Day say is a worse scenario than in classic war, these having been thrown into the middle of civil wars. And um, well, on a bad day or so on, he will by sound or smell or something or a conversation he will fall into his state uh, and uh, he will actually hear the sergeant uh, giving him orders to fire. Now the sergeant giving orders to fire because uh, they're protecting people and a group of child soldiers, boys and girls, 9, 10, 12, 14, 16, are actually attacking uh, the position they are uh, holding to protect people. And, and so he actually hears the order uh, to fire he feels his finger pulling the trigger, and he's looking through the sight, and he's seeing the head of a child exploding. And so the question is, is how many uh, of these circumstances can one handle before you actually become yourself a casualty 
uh, by having to use this lethal force in protecting others. The other example is uh, a patrol that was in Rwanda where they came upon a rape site and they were mostly all killed, they were mutilated terribly, and a few were still alive. And the platoon commander had a decision of whether to order his soldiers to go in to provide some solace and some assistance to the few that were still alive, or uh, not to go in. And the reason that he had to take a decision is because there was such a high level of prevalence of HIV AIDS and the chances of infection was, was very high. And so uh, when I uh, raised this with the contingents that were with me, uh, the bulk of them said that they would not let their officer order the troops in to help because they were dying anyways and they were killing them all over the place. And so uh, the risk was too high. Uh, three countries said they would go in. The uh, case in point is, is that uh, when the officer of that patrol turned around to give the order to his soldiers to go in to assist and bring a bit of solace to those who are still surviving, he was too late. The, the soldiers had already jumped in and were trying to do that. And that patrol was a Canadian patrol. And so why do they do that? Why do we do that? What makes us react that way? consistently, and what is the impact of that on those who actually are caught up in such ethical and moral and legal dilemmas. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the nature of conflict now. It's not war, it's conflict, and how we are into conflict resolution, and we're nowhere near getting into the realm of conflict prevention. Thank you very much. Thank you, General Dulaire. I think we're going to end up talking a lot about Africa today. And I just want to add one little footnote on the issue of rape camps. I think it was Madam Justice Florence Zumba, Mumba, excuse me, uh, at the International Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, who was one of those who declared rape a crime against humanity. I don't know quite which came first, but um, and that was related to the rape camps in Bosnia. Um, and rape is an inadequate word for what went on there. Um, and regarding D-Day too, it's the anniversary as we know, it's also the anniversary this weekend, I believe, of the Six Day War, is it not, Dr. Yes. Aboyesh? So I will call upon you to speak next, impact of war on civilians. Thank you. I want to ask, you know, even from my personal perspective, what is war? Because as a Palestinian, my life was a war. I was fighting on a daily basis just to survive. I saw the war every day in the killing of my daughters, in my suffering. But I saw the hope in the newborn I delivered. There is no difference between the Muslim, the Jewish, the Christian, the Druze, Bedouin. But I learned in my life, even in times of war, that life is what we make it, always has been always will be. And there is a difference between being insider or outsider to live inside the war. I lived in both. I walked in this world, in Afghanistan, in Palestine, in Iraq, in many countries as insider and outsider. There is difference between the one who is inside the, fi the fire and the one who is watching it. And also we need to ask how much of war do we see on the screen? This war, which is man-made. It's man-made, and that's the hope. It's man-made. What can we do to challenge this man-made war by preventing it, by acting to stop it? Is it the soldier who is killed or wounded, or the innocent child, daughter, mother, or old? It's our children. A grandchildren dying before they are fully adults, or being disfigured wounded or mentally scarred for life. It's hundreds of thousands of human beings dying years before their time. It's our children seeing their bodies, limbs blown of their bodies. It's millions of people separated forever from the ones they loved. War is a genocide, it's torture, it's a propaganda and dishonesty, and it's a slavery of humanity. What is our expectation from a child who sees his father shooted in front of him and can't do anything? 
What about parents who are unable to mourn or carry out a proper burial rites for the dead with all the emotional, psychological, and the spiritual distress? War in this world in the 21st century, we see these casualties and dead people as numbers. Human beings, they are not numbers. They are humans. They have names. They have faces. They have plans. They have hopes. It's shame to look at the humans as statistics. Look in Syria, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, everywhere. Nation has been traumatized, lost a generation, brutalized and destigmatized. War has many faces. And we need to stop it. And the long-lasting effect, which we never see it. What did we see? is just one of, ten, of hundreds of what the war impacts us. War is not just to be documented and to be watched. War should be prevented. For me, my daughters were killed. And now it's five years. For them, they have passed. Five years have passed in a flash. Their cries have not ceased. The cries of pain and hope, their heart, Wrenching cries and pain never leave me or my memory. Five years have passed. Where is Bisan? Where is Mayar now? Where is Aya now? Where is Noor now? Five flowers and their pure blood, They're, they drank from the will of learning and to grow up with morals and values and tolerant Islam. They drank and slept on Palestine soil. Your names don't leave my side. Be sad with the beginning of every morning. Mayar with the cry of each child. Aya, each time I hear a verse from Quran and each time the church builds time and nor with the down's first light the promise that I had taken upon myself since day one of keeping their names and the spirit alive, we will meet and will never despair God's mercy. That's why in their memory, Daughters for Life was established for education of girls and women from the Middle East because I fully believe this world can endure. And if it wants to endure, it's only with women's education and women's role. It's time to give the women the right role. Give me five women in the history who were behind wars and disasters. It's time to give them. And I am sure if women, they didn't succeed, they will never make it worse as it's now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I should have said before, I'm sure a lot of what's being said now will provoke questions in, in your minds. Uh, we will have time for questions later on, so please um, form them in your heads. Samantha Nutt, please, your turn. Thank you very much. Um, I did want to just uh, pick up on something that Dr. Bullish said at the very, very end. I spent the last 20 years working with women and children in war zones, and uh, the 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 what he was talking about in terms of the impact of war on women and girls in particular and what's needed to really make the right kinds of investments to help populations lift themselves out of war and the role of girls education in that is absolutely vital and so I'm going to begin this is not the way I was going to start in fact I subscribe to that that usual bromide that if I'd had more time I would have written a shorter speech but, um, you know, I want to I wanna start by asking all of you here a question. Because if I said to you, what do you think is the single most important determinant of whether a child in the developing world, so in the global south, will live to see his or her fifth birthday? If I said to you, how many of you would say access to primary health care? Who would put up their hands? Anyone? A few of you. How many of you would say food and water? But it's all about food and water. That determines whether a kid will live to see his or her fifth birthday. How many of you might say mosquito nets, for example, if we're talking about Africa? Anyone? 
Well, it's good that you didn't choose that one because actually more people die from smoke inhalation related to kerosene cook stoves than actually die from malaria, even though it remains a significant contributor to maternal morbidity and mortality and children as well. But in fact, the single most important determinant in the global south of whether a child will live to see his or her fifth birthday is none of those things. It's actually that child's mother's independent access to income, which by extension is really about education, and in particular the education of women and girls. And uh, an extraordinary study was published a couple of years ago in The Lancet that was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And they looked at 30 years of demographic data um, it, for girls in the developing world. And they found that for, extra, for every extra year of education that a girl attains on average, child mortality drops by 10%. So I'm going to say that again. For every extra year of education, child mortality drops by 10%. So when we're talking about war, and when we're talking about how it is that you really lift families out of poverty, when you promote their self-reliance and their resilience, when you make it possible for them to begin rebuilding their communities and to envision a future other than more war and violence. Education and the work of Dr. Belish's uh, foundation, for example, and the work that War Child does, education is absolutely critical to that process. Now, the other thing I wanted to, to talk about this morning, and I suppose it's no coincidence that they saved the nut till the end. <laughs> my poor mother, by the way, my poor mother, where are you, Mom? There she is. So she's here. She doesn't find the postcard joke very funny. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> it was before the internet. Now, but I have to say, she's still not terribly keen about what I do for a living. I just probably say, yo, no, I'm not terribly keen. Why couldn't you have been a regular doctor? Um, but uh, now, we sort of, now we've come to an understanding that when I'm traveling to different parts of the world, that when I say I'm going to Europe, that that's a euphemism for someplace else unpleasant. <laughs> Um, but, you know, the interesting thing is that I've been doing this work for 20 years now, which is hard to believe. Um, and uh, for those of you doing the math on that, <laughs> how many of you are trying to do the math on that? <laughs> I'm 44, we can all move on. <laughs> But, uh, you know, what's interesting to me, and what was interesting to me reading through the play, I was uh, sent an advanced copy of Mother Courage, which we'll be uh, watching here this afternoon. Um, and, and Brecht, when he wrote this play, he actually redid the ending because initially he found that audiences were almost too sympathetic to the mother. Um, and yet here she was, you know, she was in war, she loses her children to war, but she was also trying to exploit war to make a living for herself. And one of the things that um, I found really curious about the play, or that really struck me, is that even though war changes absolutely everything in people's lives, nothing about war ever fundamentally changes. And when you're going back, you know, you can go back 50 years, you can go back, you can look at wars today, you can go back centuries to look at war, and still the outcomes are pretty much the same. Towns are seized, and then they are lost, and then they are seized again. Families bury their young, and then they usually bury their old, and then they bury their young again. Generations lost to war. Women and little girls are raped, and they are beaten, and they are humiliated, and this still goes on in the world. Children, and I have interviewed thousands of children over the past 20 years, children who will talk to me about waking up in the middle of the night screaming, and children who will also talk to me about not being able to sleep because all they hear are screams. And what is extraordinary as well in this context is that the lines, those lines between, you know, war is so full of paradoxes. And uh, General Dallaire talked about this earlier on when he talked about the idea of, of even child soldiers. It is astonishing to me how quickly victims can become abusers and abusers can become victims. And this, these are war's paradoxes, and those lines, those lines between abused and abuser and militant and freedom fighter and just and unjust and liberator and occupier, you know, these lines blur in every war to the point where they lose all meaning. And in my experience, these are words that we simply conjure and deploy as manipulations or affirmations or confirmations in this nasty process of picking sides. 
And unfortunately, for as long as there are sides, there will always be war. And on this side of the world, we tend to like our arguments about war to be simple. And we tend to want to talk about it in the context of good guys and bad guys. But I have to be honest with you, war rarely offers that tidy a narrative. And I think that that is probably the, the, the great brilliance that is embedded in the play that you're going to see this afternoon, because it really does demonstrate just how nuanced some of these issues are and how complex they really are. And, and unfortunately, I think many of us in this side of the world that we don't often have that language for, for war. And we don't often debate it in the ways that we ought to. And we tend to oversimplify them. But if there is one thing that I have learned from my work over the past two decades, it's that you know, war is, I have experienced firsthand, war is bloodlust. And it's terrifying reality. And I can assure you that I am no longer seduced by those tales of heroism and altruism. Uh, unfortunately, there are more than 26 conflicts raging in the world right now. There are millions of people falling asleep in the world at this moment who have to listen to that crackle of automatic gunfire and wonder with absolute dread how many minutes they have left until it will be right on top of them. And it is a terrifying, inescapable, deep-rooted type of fear. There are little women, little girls and women who can't go more than two blocks in places like Darfur and Eastern Congo and South Sudan because they will be violently and brutally sexually assaulted. And I think one of the most important conversations that we can have today as we watch the play and as we listen uh, to my esteemed colleagues here is that when we say things like, and here we are on the 20 year anniversary of the Rwandan genocide, when we say things like never again, what we are really saying, unfortunately, is until we meet again. And these are lessons that we sadly don't learn. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. There are two major things that jump to my mind, and one is uh, how you resolve conflicts once they're, quote, finished, if they ever are, and two is how you prevent them in the first place. Uh, and I think that would give us enough to talk about to keep us here forever. <laughs> but um, can we talk first a little bit about post-conflict resolution, about when things end? What do you do to, to try and put that child soldier, that young woman, back in the village that they came from, that perhaps they were the person responsible for the murder of their parents. In fact, more than likely, they might have been. Um, and what do you do and how do you help the women who were raped go back to their town where in Bosnia they're living right next door to the people who raped them who haven't been prosecuted? How, how do you put those things together? I mean, and there's a bunch of different models that have been tried all over the world. Um, Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, International Criminal Court Prosecutions, etc. Samantha, do you want to lead off on this one? Sure. Um, well, this is, you know, that it's a very important question. There are different ways that you can actually promote reconciliation within communities. The, the fundamental issue, though, is that in general, conflicts don't, they don't start with a kind of starter's pistol and then you run around the track and then they end all of a sudden. Uh, in general, they, they have a tendency, especially when you're talking about civil wars, to linger and, and become very brooding and, and just sort of fester on for a while, almost like an unwanted relative on a holiday weekend. Um, and I have a very dark sense of humor. That's the other thing you'll probably appreciate about the play this afternoon. Um, but you know, so when you in that kind of a context, right? You 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 find that that communities, especially, even though there's been a peace process, they'll be moving back, and there'll be disputes over land. There'll be some ongoing tensions, ongoing resentments, and no established judicial infrastructure to be able to reconcile those grievances. And so people take things into their own hands, and then they tend to you know exacerbate the conflict uh, further. 
And a good example of this is in South Sudan, where you did have a peace process, where you did have democrat democratic elections after 30 years of conflict, and it only took a couple of years for it to slide back into civil war, which is happening right now. And, and Warchal, we've got programming right on the front lines there in, uh, in South Sudan, it's in the Malakal area. And one of the things that I have found is that while it is very important to work at that um, high level to make sure that you are prosecuting those who have committed war crimes and holding them accountable and holding their governments accountable and trying to promote peace at that level. You also need to work at the grassroots level. And one of the most important ways that you can do that is to make sure that you are investing in the rule of law and access to justice and training of lawyers and paralegals, uh, providing alternative dispute mechanisms, conflict resolution at the community level. But you also need to help people restore a sense of normalcy. Schools become very, very important. Other community networks and civil society organizations, and by making those kinds of investments, when people can envision a different future, and hope here is such a cliche, right? We talk about hope, I mean, I blame Obama. Um, <laughs> that, that we now think of hope as such a cliche, but in fact, without hope when it comes to war, uh, there is no reason for people to do anything differently. And so it's by creating that, that normal environment, getting kids back into school, creating economic opportunities, uh, engaging women, engaging communities in the peace process, providing those mechanisms for them to resolve their disputes peacefully, that that becomes vitally important. Unfortunately, I'm just gonna wrap up now, that it's at those moments that our attention tends to wane. We're often involved in a conflict in the early stages, whether it's uh, Syria, um, or many other conflicts around the world, and then we begin to lose interest, and then the funding dries up, and so we're often running around trying to save lives, but we're not actually making the kinds of investments that make it possible for people to have a reason to live. Compassion um, fatigue. That's right, yeah. and that's one of the biggest challenges. Okay. Dr. Aboyesh, I mean, the war in which your family was involved, was, was part of, it, it hasn't ended. I mean, it's, it's a conflict that has yet to be resolved. I mean, how, how do you deal with that? You know, in any conflict, and why do we have conflict? Conflict arises when we violate mm -hmm. someone's dignity or respect. That's the conflict. And when we speak about reconciliation, even for reconciliation, we need the truth. Like in medicine, we need the accurate diagnosis in order to set up the right treatment. So that's why the situation in the Middle East, there is a problem and there is conflict and there is nations, people there who are fighting for their own interest and their identity. And there are two different people there. Palestinians are occupied, we need to admit that. Palestinians are occupied and Israelis are the occupier. Israelis, they have the power, Palestinians are the weaker. But both of them are responsible about solving the conflict. And they have, even the occupied is part of the responsibility. I say it, don't accept your life to be a victim more than once. The patient who is weaker is responsible about taking the medication and his health and his life. So it's the responsibility even of the occupied, of the patient, of the raped, of the tortured person. How can we move to be resilient in a positive way to move forward? So we need a few things. Number one, education. That's what I believe in. Education is vital because there is difference between the one who knows and the one who doesn't. Education is the light which helps us in times of darkness to decide where to go and what to do. And I fully believe it's education of girls and women. It's time, if you go to any country, the world can endure with the truth and justice, but I say it, it can endure with women's education. It's time to invest in women's education, a healthy, educated girl and woman will raise a healthy, educated children, husband, family, community, and nation. If you go to any country and to ask about the level of development of that country, don't ask about the GDP. Ask about the level of women's education and women's role. 
in that country, the more women are educated, the less violent that community is. The more women are engaged and have active role in shaping and decision making at the political level, sitting at the table as we are sitting here, two women and two men according to their potential. And women, they have the potential. At that moment, I fully believe, as a doctor, nothing is impossible in life. The only impossible thing in life I believe in is to return my daughters back. But anything in life I planned personally, I planned, I succeeded to achieve it. It took time from Jabalia camp to Cairo University, to London, to Italy, to Belgium, to Harvard. Everything is possible in life. And look around. No one knows what will happen tomorrow, for the good or bad. And peace can happen in the Middle East. But peace should never be by force. It must be by choice. And peace will never be just and good for one. It must be just and good for all. At that moment, when we realize this fact, and to practice it, and to find the right people to adopt it and to be a strong advocate of it, at that moment, the conflict will be behind. General Dallaire, the doctor mentioned the, the importance of, of admitting, establishing, quote, truth. Now, that's the premise behind Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, and we have seen, uh, uh, we have seen Truth and Reconciliation Commissions all over the world, including Latin America, which we haven't even mentioned. Um, how much good do you think they've done? Um, there are a few absolutes, uh, one uh, for human beings, one is love, uh, the other one is, is uh, justice, and whether you can achieve that uh, in order to set a, a level playing field for people to be able to reconcile is, is I think, one of the most demanding tasks in post-conflict. However, first of all, I don't think that we'll ever have peace in the world unless we have peace in the Middle East. The Middle East being the, the, the core of humanity and its essence, uh, if the Middle East is never resolved, there will never be peace. And that uh, is, in my opinion, lost on so many of the players as they tend to look at it far too locally versus really realizing the massive strategic impact that that has for the rest of the world uh, and the ramifications it's had uh, even with 9-11 and so on. So I think that's the first element. Uh, the second thing in, in this sort of truth side or you know, the sort of the post-conflict uh, dimension is, is that um, what's your most effective tool uh, in order to prevent conflict from happening uh, because uh, it is nearly impossible to imagine in many of the uh, world um, uh, areas that we find ourselves uh, with the frictions between our differences uh, where they don't uh, degenerate into, into conflict for a variety of reasons, be it ethnic, religious, tribal, uh, power sharing, uh, uh, and the like. And uh, I would argue that the most effective a tool uh, to prevent conflict from happening again is to have, in fact, the most effective reconciliation tools to be able to prevent it from happening again. Because uh, we'll, we'll go back, I mean, the Middle East, uh, there, there, the friction there goes way, way back. Um, when we were in Yugoslavia, they kept bringing up battles of 500 years ago for which they are still sort of arguing today who won and who lost and, and, and why they're at each other's throat. Um, just look at how we ran away from uh, the 250th anniversary of the Battles of the Plains of Abraham. Uh, nobody went there. Every politician in this country on both sides hid. And so a few wackos actually took the, the hill and started reading the FLQ manifesto. Uh, I mean, it is a sign of enormous immaturity of a society that it can't go uh, and commemorate, commemorate 
something where people fought and died on all sides uh, and our own and our own ancestry and and uh, commemorate that they, they did sacrifice their lives for whatever happened there, whether we liked the results or not. So we, can, we don't even handle that, uh, let alone imagine uh, how Rwandans are going to handle uh, 20 years now down the road uh, a genocide. You know, how, how do you sort of work that out? Um, and so uh, I think that uh, there is enormous amount uh, of um, initiatives that are being thrown at uh, trying to do post-conflict or in-conflict sort of reconciliation to prevent uh, those conflicts from regenerating. And it is terribly more complex now than before because in the uh, previous when you had nation states against nation states, you had a sequential uh, series of events. You had frictions that would degenerate, they declare war, they send in the military, they fight, and the last one standing wins, and then you rebuild. That was sort of the way it used to be done. But now what you've got is concurrent activity. You've got people trying to provide protection and security, while you've got other people trying to build up the infrastructure. You've got people working on human rights, people on uh, trying to respond to humanitarian crises uh, and development. All those people are all there at the same time trying to, to work that out. And so we, we don't have the tools to make that happen easily now because we're still on job training. Afghanistan and places like that are still places of on-job training. And the sources, uh, and I'll bring you to my conclusion, the sources are complex to try to figure out too. When you look at the African continent and all the artificial countries that were created and that gener generate so much friction uh, because of those boundaries that, that were established to make them nation states, uh, you gotta wonder where all this stuff starts. Uh, the question is often asked to me is, when really did the, the seeds of the idea of genocide happen in Rwanda? Uh, did it happen uh, on the night that the plane was shot down in 20 years ago? Did it happen during the revolution in 59 when one group took on the other group and was killing a lot of them and a million ended up refugee? Did it happen when the colonial powers were there uh, and they started separating the two ethnic groups? Did it happen with the complicity of the Catholic Church that actually taught in the schools that the, the groups were different and that one was more advantaged than the other right in, right in the classrooms with, with the kids. And so uh, these things have long uh, gestation periods and long memories. So you need some radical new tools and I would, I cannot reinforce enough. Uh, one, uh, because many of those nations are so young, the education, educate, objective education uh, with values, yes, and, and moral references. Education in order to give the intellectual rigor for those who are being educated to understand the problems and that same intellectual rigor to figure out the answers, empowering them. The second one to me is empowering women. Women are not part of the exercise and the guys are far too hung up and are holding far too much of these male-dominated societies and cultures that are preventing them from demonstrating the flexibility and the courage to actually go into whole new arenas. And it's only through the introduction of the women and empowering them that I think we will actually see the breakthroughs uh, in regards to ultimate reconciliation. And I think the last one is respect. Uh, do we all consider ourselves equal? Uh, do we actually consider ourselves uh, the same humans or are some more human than others? Is it possible that some feel that they can tolerate others. Well, who are you to tolerate somebody else? The only way we can actually reduce frictions is by respect, which means we're all equal. And so are we all equal? And I would argue that we're really having a problem with that to overwhelm our frictions by not necessarily recognizing that the seven-year-old kid that I saw in the middle of the genocide uh, and protected uh, in the midst of that conflict that little seven-year-old boy was just as much a human child as my seven-year-old son back home when I left for Africa. They're both exactly the same. Why do we have two different uh, uh, schemes of considering uh, human beings? And so I am an optimist. And in so doing, uh, I believe that we will one day resolve our frictions without going to conflict. 
I think by advancing human rights, by advancing uh, uh, empowerment of women, by education and objective education, we will achieve a lot of that. But it might take a couple centuries. <laughs> so what? So what? What's a couple centuries if all of a sudden we finally stop slaughtering each other and we're able to work? And I'll end with this example. We pull out of Afghanistan and the frictions are still there and there's maybe even a bit exacerbated. Uh, and we said, we've been there 10 years and look at the difficulties. We've been over 60 years in Cyprus. And there's, the two groups are still there. There's still UN peacekeepers along the Green Line, but they're not killing each other. The economies are growing, they're talking. So what if it takes another 20 years for them to finally realize, geez, you know, we really don't need these guys anymore. We could create a, a federation. So what's 80 years? What's 80 years and bringing about uh, a nation that can live in a level of harmony? And so time has got to be shifted from our Cartesian short-term concept of time to a whole different plateau. Uh, and consider that if we're going to be of any assistance to many of these nations, we gotta go in there for the long haul to assist them. 40, 50, and 60 years assisting to resolve uh, and reduce those frictions uh, by a multitude of tools that I hope uh, we can assist with. One of the primary ones, and thank God for the women who have put their position so much forward in North America, more even than in Europe, uh, is the fact that we can empower that group that's not been part of the exercise because they've been completely put aside by both cultural and religious dimensions. And listen, I've got no problem uh, saying that the Catholic Church is misogynist. Uh, I mean, we have a perception that uh, we have not yet broken, that women are not equal. And until we crash that, uh, you are absolutely right. We will not uh, find the resolution, the fundamental resolution uh, of the frictions that bring us to conflict. General, just further to your Cyprus example, as you're saying, we've got to be in for the long haul. And Canada was in for a reasonably long haul with Cyprus, but we pulled out, did we not? I mean, how much are we putting our money where our mouth is? I was hoping for that question. <laughs> and I'm not even going to talk as a politician. Anymore. You can't anymore. You can't. Well, no, 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 my, my, my actual last date is on Tuesday, so I'm sorry. To... So his comments so, are post dated. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so the, the, the Governor General could so, still put the squeeze on me. But I, um, um, there are now, not to say they're effective, uh, but there are now uh, about 110,000 peacekeepers around the world. And the reason I say it's not because they're effective is because uh, the missions in which they find themselves in are very complex, they're very ambiguous, the mandates are still not clear, uh, and so there's still considerable uh, dilemmas of how to apply, uh, not the use of force as much as the presence of security in many of these conflicts, and linking it to uh, 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 the diplomatic and political and humanitarian side. But out of that 110,000, at a time when those missions are so much more complex than it used to be during the Cold War when we were up to our ears in it, um, we have 43 peacekeepers. This country has 43 peacekeepers in the world. And so uh, you gotta turn around and you say, uh, does that make any sense? When we know we have the capacity to be able to assist significantly uh, in uh, assisting moving these missions to be more effective in, on the ground. We've got the technology, we've got the logistics, we've got the command and control, we've got the, the doctrines, the trainings, we even got the languages. And so just look as an example, Central African Republic right now. The UN is screaming for peacekeepers to smother this, uh, this uh, potential genocide that's out there. And so what do you got? You've got African nations with nearly no equipment and very little capabilities. Uh, you've got an ex-colonial power 
The last gang you want to have on the ground is those guys, uh, and particularly French in this case, uh, uh, sitting there uh, supposedly trying to stabilize. We have thousands of French Canadians speaking troops. We know the area, we know the people, we know what the problem is. We've got diplomats who've been in Africa for decades. We've got development people who have been there for decades. We could be a significant factor in trying to attenuate or bring a certain level of security to permit uh, the nation and protection to maybe not go and degenerate into, into uh, a genocide. But all we've done, and the answers I've been getting to, right in the Senate itself is, oh, we've given 16 million in humanitarian aid. Well, that's what we're doing in Darfur. We're, well, all we're doing is throwing cash at the problem and still watching it go. So I really wonder why Canadians simply are quite prepared to throw their cash at humanitarian assistance, knowing that it's going to be simply sustaining the conflict. Because those who are the belligerents are saying, hey, they're getting aid, and by the by, I'll scrum some of it in the meantime. So how can we logically be part of aiding and abetting these conflicts by providing humanitarian assistance and not engaging politically, development-wise, and certainly security-wise? Thank you. Samantha, I'd, I'd like to just ask you a little bit about the nature of aid on the ground. I mean, you've been quite critical about some of the stuff that just doesn't work, and, and we feel good when we write checks, and we do. Um, I can remember an instance thank, in... Thank you for the odd check I get. To <laughs> <laughs> I remember an instance in Mozambique, which was a country that had, I don't know, 30 or 40 years civil war, and, and it did end. And they, a president who was removed from office, and uh, removed himself from office, that's the important distinction, um, and the country's beginning to work. In that country, among other things, there was a series of, of work of psychologists who, who, who captured a way in which the people there sought to resolve the reintegration of the child, child soldiers through traditional um, means that, that we would not have imposed. Also, a, a group of fishermen I encountered who, who very proudly pulled a book out of the back pocket saying, look, and it was a well-thumbed book, this is how we solve our arguments now. And obviously an aid organization had been in with some weird little book on conflict resolution that you would just roll your eyes at and say that couldn't work. But somehow it did. As a cynical journalist, I wondered how much and whether it was just for my benefit. But I thought perhaps not. What do you see that works? Um, that's an excellent question, Karen. And I, and I also wanted to just echo what, um, what uh, General Dallaire has said. You know, it's astonishing to me that as Canadians, if you still look at most of the surveys that are done, most of the polls that ask Canadians what we think our biggest contribution is to the world, uh, too many of us still put peacekeeping up there as number one, and it's astonishing because we're something like 54th in the world in terms of our contributions to peacekeeping. We have just uh, a few uh, more peacekeepers deployed than, than Chad, um, which is... We don't want is, them. We don't. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, peacekeeping has, the whole concept of peacekeeping has become something of a pejorative, right? We've gone through this period of time uh, where we have reinvented our militarism as Canadians and that we want something that is a lot more or we are celebrating something that is a lot more aggressive than the whole notion of peacekeeping which has been seen as this uh, more uh, soft liberal kind of approach and, and it's really unfortunate because there are so many conflicts in the world in which our expertise and our capacity would uh, go a long way towards bringing communities together and keeping people safe. And the Central African Republic is only one of them. Darfur is certainly another. Uh, South Sudan is another. And, and unfortunately, uh, these are not conversations that we're having, and yet I think we must have them. On your question of the reintegration process and how you actually help communities recover after war, uh, it's, it's extremely complex, and a one-size-fits-all approach will never, ever work. It depends on the extent to which uh, people have a history and tradition of, of conversation and discourse and how open and transparent they will be. Some societies are very closed and they have a hard time talking about it. Other societies are much more open. In Rwanda, 
Um, you know, people will talk a lot less at the community level, then you go across the border to Eastern Congo and you'll be having a conversation with somebody that you just met and they'll tell you their entire story, which is just heart-wrenching. Um, and so those oral traditions and experiences figure, I think, very prominently in a community's ability to, to recover and to support one another. When it comes to the issue of reintegrating children who have been affected by war, there are certain things that we know work. Uh, the most important thing is to create a normal environment for kids. And that's very hard to do when the war is still going on. Uh, so, for example, in Syria, right, and you have kids that are coming across the border, their lives are still uh, very much on hold. And so for them, the idea of beginning to recover can't take place because they actually are not back in their communities. There's this sense of, uh, there's no sense of permanence, and that makes it a lot harder. What we have found is that uh, education is critical to both boys and girls in those environments, so getting the schools back up and running, getting teachers trained, uh, allowing kids to catch up so that they go back to the appropriate grade level. One of the biggest obstacles we see in terms of the reintegration of child soldiers is that these are kids who may have been fighting for seven or eight years, and I'm talking about girls as well, girls who were abducted or held as sex slaves or who are participating uh, in, in both combat and non-combat roles. And so when the last time they were in school, they were in grade one, you know, and, and now they're 16 and they don't want to go back and be in grade one. And so as a result of that, they tend to form criminal gangs. They're much more easily re-recruited by militias. So we do know that having access to education uh, and then also having access to meaningful work, uh, economic development opportunities, that those are absolutely critical in terms of helping to provide a normative structure, making it possible for kids to envision a different future. And I've interviewed kids over the years who, 10 years ago, in places like Eastern Congo and in Darfur, Sudan, who had just come out of the militia groups or who were thinking about joining the militia groups. Um, and after a period of time where they were able to get caught up in school, get back in, and you know those same kids who 10 years ago would have said to me, well, I'm just waiting until I'm old enough to go back and fight legally. Uh, because they've been handed over as part of the of the peace process. Now those are kids who are graduating and, and tell me they want to be doctors and lawyers and, and future leaders of their countries. And sometimes that's all it takes for any one of us. And and Dr. Bullish's story I think is is emblematic of that. It's this idea that we can improve and that we can envision um, a life of, of of beauty and wonder and hope and self-reliance. And when you can provide children with those hopes and aspirations and those dreams, it's remarkable what a psychological difference that makes in people's lives. And, uh, and I've seen that time and time and time again. It doesn't mean that some of those kids won't have underlying major psychological difficulties. And unfortunately, some of those kids, and I know that the general has, has come face to face with them, and so have I, you know, that have been fighting for seven or eight years and raping and looting and pillaging. And, and some of them are, are sociopaths. And, um, mm. and, and that's... You can't fix that. And you can't fix that. No. Can we end? I'd like to end with you, Dr. Abayesh. What has helped your children, the three daughters you still have, and your sons? What's helped them is their resilience, which comes from their faith, their parents, the education of their parents helped them a lot. And that's what I say. What is the major challenge to our success in our life? It's personal responsibility. And my children, they took that responsibility to move forward and they learned from. And this is one of the messages we need to learn. We need to listen to our children. They are wise enough to teach us and I remember it, my daughter Shada, who was severely wounded with her sisters. She was studying day and night to be one of the top 10 in Palestine in the high school. Because all of my girls, my daughters, that I'm proud of, and I say it, if I have 100 of them, I thank God all of the time for what did he gave me, give me and what he took from me. They never succeeded less than 97% in their schools. They have their own plans. Be San, I wanted her to go to study medicine, but she said no. She succeeded in high school, 97.5, and was supposed to get her BA. After she lost, that's important, after she lost her mother, 
four months before she was killed. Her mother passed away 16th of September 2008, and she was supposed to get her BA a few months later. She came to me, as many of our children, and the student, the nightmare when they have academic exams. She came to say to me, now I realized one thing, that academic exams are the easiest exams in life. The most difficult exams in life are life exams. When we are tested with the loss of the beloved ones, and she is the one who supported me to continue my work in Israel, to say count on God and our support. So Shada was severely wounded, studying days and night on candles. Three days later, 16th of January, she was wounded. 21st of January was her birthday. And I said, we have to celebrate it. And with the bandages over her eyes and her right hand, she said to me, if I can't see with my right eye, I have my left. If I can't write with my right hand, I have from tomorrow bring me papers and pencils to practice with my left hand. She spent four months in the hospital. And she lost the sight in one eye. Two malformed fingers in the right hand, but she was determined. She said, I have to go back to do the high school exam to achieve the plans and the dreams of my sisters. I didn't expect much from her because the high school exams, and it's now running in Palestine, it's a unified standardized exam for the whole country. At the same moment, from the whole curriculum, they don't mind what did you pass through. I didn't expect much. And she did the exam, and the day we were supposed to leave to Canada, they announced the result, and she succeeded as nothing happened to her she succeeded 96%. Shada will graduate next year from electrical computer engineering at U of T. So Shada, she proved that the antidote of hatred and revenge and anger is determination to be resilient in a positive way, not to adapt or to accept what happened, but to take responsibility and to succeed and to prove that life is what we make it always has been, always will be. So it's a message to all of us. It's a message of action to all of us when we speak about the world. We need, we want order in this world. What makes the evil to flourish is good people to do nothing. It's our world, yours, mine, and everyone, to ask what can you do to speak out, to break the silence about our world because violence that General Mudelaire spoke about the Middle East. Violence across its barriers. Hatred across its barriers as disease does. So it's our responsibility. We need to proact, not to watch it. And each of us, I am sure, each of us can do something. When we all come together to do something, I am sure our children, to whom we are accountable, we can inherit them a good legacy a good future, a good life. And it's time for all of us to do it. It's not late. Let us leave this meeting with the message of action. Thank you. Thank you. I want to open things up to questions. Do we have questions? And I will shield my eyes. I hope we have questions. Oh, come on. <laughs> Good. No. <laughs> okay. The microphone is coming your way, sir. Thank you. Recently, I was in Sydney, Australia, and I had the pleasure of meeting Major General Tim Ford at the Sydney University. Uh, I sat in a class with my daughter in human rights. And uh, in the introduction of uh, myself to Mr. Ford, uh, uh, General Ford, he stated to me that Canada's commitment to peacekeeping has declined. And most importantly, 
is quite noticeable in this world. Now, as a traveling Canadian, um, and I see myself as an ambassador when I travel, I was quite embarrassed by that statement. My question is, how much influence does public opinion have in a UN peacekeeping mission or in the development of a mission mandate? General Dallaire, um, let me just tell you how difficult it is, not only as you travel for business or whatever, but imagine if you're traveling as uh, on the humanitarian side, uh, where my work is with um, child soldiers, uh, and I am I'm facing a, my my commander who's using child soldiers uh, wantonly in Eastern Congo, and I'm accusing him of of being uh, nowhere near a commander when he has to use kids to fight his wars. I said, well, you can't handle adults. You you got to use children. To, uh, and he he turns around and he says, uh, uh, why why are you chastising me? He said, what about your own country? And when I look at my own country, uh, um, I don't know how much you have followed the case of Omar Khadr, uh, but, but uh, the whole part of the fact that he was 15 is lost in the, in the exercise, completely and, and totally. And we're one of the leading nations that brought in the, the Optional Protocol on Child Rights uh, in 2000, we're the ones who've been pushing the rest of the world to implement it. And when it comes to a case of our own, because we don't like the politics of the family, uh, bingo, or maybe because he killed uh, uh, you know, one of our, uh, uh, a Western soldier, apparently, uh, in this conflict, uh, we, we, we'll throw out all the rules. We'll throw out, it doesn't count anymore. We, we have uh, essentially no credibility in that regard. And as they say in New York, we hear Canada only because it, it's very loud, but we really can't understand what they're saying. And so uh, that's the, the position. In regards to, to public opinion, um, I have a lot of stock in public opinion um, uh, because it can move policy, uh, except I, I find it, it's diffused and it's, it's not uh, well-structured. And uh, I think the under 30 generation, the generation I call the generation without borders because they're already planetary, they're already global with the, with the social media and are able to coalesce much more and will become more activists. Uh, I think that the, what we're missing is the fact that part of the NGO world, the non-government world, uh, is to be advocates, is, is, is to raise hell when we think that things are not going properly. And so uh, I uh, regret that one, there are not enough people joining the NGO world, creating NGOs from scratch. Uh, we will throw some cash at it, but we don't engage in it. And so the political process is weakened because barely, not even 2% of the population are carried carry members of our, of our parties who choose who ultimately we send to have the authority to decide, uh, but we don't have enough in the world of the NGO that if they coalesce more and more, they will become more the voice of humanity. They're the eyes and ears of humanity now. They'll become the voice of humanity, and I believe as they mature and working together more, we'll be able to influence public opinion and policy. And I think the way to get at uh, our interventions where our self-interests are not immediately evident. For remember, nobody came to Rwanda because I was told there was nothing there. There was nothing there for it. And one even told me that, oh, the only thing that's here are human beings and there's too many of them anyways. And so beyond self-interest, the only tool I think uh, that can push uh, a government to consider its sense of responsibility uh, beyond self-interest and beyond its borders uh, is uh, by the coalition of a much, much stronger participatory NGO community.
Can I pick up on that for one second? Yeah, please do. Um, I, I echo that, and I would put this to you as well in terms of one of the challenges that we're facing. I mean, we, I am in the business of raising hell, and I belong to an organization that tends to speak up and to speak out and uh, is not shy about... Uh, some of the problems that we're seeing in the world and what we think needs to happen and, and sometimes criticizing Canada's foreign policy in that. Um, the problem is that those of us who are in the business of raising hell are also spending a lot of time in audits. And, yeah, and, uh, and this has, there's no question that this has created a real chill within the NGO sector, the non-governmental organization sector in particular. But if you look at other countries of the, in the world where uh, civil society organizations are allowed to have a strong voice, are actually allowed to speak up and to criticize policy where they think that that's appropriate, you know, ultimately it is the public that supports those organizations that can decide whether they think that those views are are legitimate and should be heard or not. Um, and our, our, our democracy is strengthened by making sure that you have those organizations that are able to mobilize and to speak out on policies and to make us stronger. And unfortunately, um, the last few years, it has become harder and harder and harder, whether, especially when you're talking about environmental organizations, but also human rights organizations, uh, to speak up. And we are being caught up in what's loosely called political and political activities just by criticizing or speaking up on a particular policy that you may disagree with. And, um, and you know, not that anyone is afraid of an audit, uh, because if you're doing things right, then you should never fear for, uh, an audit. At the same time, it consumes your resources and your staff time, and it takes away from the programs and the work that you're actually trying to do, which is your biggest priority. Uh, it also adds to your overhead to be able to, man to have to manage these kinds of situations. And so a lot of organizations have, have stayed away from it for that exact reason. And it sends a, a chill through the sector, and it's, uh, and it's quite unfortunate. But to the, to the question as well, um, Canada's reputation has changed and in dramatic ways over the last 10 years, but over the last five years in particular. And beneath this debate, though, around peacekeeping, there is another aspect to this conversation. Uh, and, I, and the general and I have spoken about this before too, which is that um, within the military itself, d there isn't a, a, a tremendous love anymore for the concept of peacekeeping. It's seen as a kind of anachronism, you know, this sort of thing that was, was okay at one moment in time, but we've all moved on from the Pearsonian legacy, and now we're in the biz business of, of counterterrorism and counterinsurgency activities, and we don't want to go overseas and sit around with blue helmets uh, protecting you know, streets and, and shopping markets. We want to be out there and doing what we're trained to do, and there is that tension. And so uh, whether you're talking about Darfur or South Sudan or any other conflict that you might have in the news, you may have a tremendous amount of, of, of public pressure and momentum for that, uh, and yet still not be able to get those kinds of commitments. And, and with that, I would also add that, that our reputation when it comes to the extractive industries around the world um, and Canada's involvement in uh, some countries that are um, extremely volatile uh, in terms of our multinational enterprises being involved, that that has also caused a, a great damage to our, our international reputation and this alignment of our aid and trade interests. We're no longer seen as a country that is as deeply invested in protecting the vulnerable and helping and, and being a, a positive force in the world, unfortunately. Can I just add something? There's got to be a caveat, if I may. Um, and that's part of the debate we've had. Um, uh, for, I've been in the child, child soldier um, prevention and um, neutralization of them for the last 10 years. Um, I don't go to the Canadian government, ever, because there's no interest at all. And certainly not even interest in child soldiers who make it here who are trying to rehabilitate and reintegrate Canadian society, let alone uh, them able to get into the country as unaccompanied minors even. Uh, uh, however, I'm uh, knocking at the doors of the United States, uh, UK, Sweden, uh, Germany regularly uh, uh, for, for that. The second thing is, is that I, I think it is important to recognize that with the, with the end of the Cold War and with civil wars that are ongoing, uh, the uh, concept of peacekeeping of the Chapter 6 where we stand there with a blue, blue beret, short pants, and no red card or penalty box, and observe because both sides want us there uh, to assist them is over. It doesn't exist anymore. In these imploding nations and failing states, 
uh, we have the civilian population that is, as I said earlier on, the target and also uh, the prize and the protection thereof uh, does require ultimately the ability to use force to protect in extremists. So we're into the business now of blue helmets, meaning chapter seven, meaning to be able to protect. And in that context, uh, the greatest objection is the the fact that the UN, although Brahimi brought in some reforms in 1999, the UN is still a very ineffective instrument of trying to command, control, plan, and strategically allot resources. So there's 110,000 peacekeepers out there, but you've got to question how effective they are. And because the developed countries are not participating in that, uh, their effectiveness is significantly reduced. And so until we want to reform that, and we've refused to get engaged in that, uh, we're staying out of it. And I think that's abdicating a fundamental responsibility that we have uh, to the concept of conflict prevention, conflict resolution versus peacekeeping. We are getting tight on time. If there is another question, the there lady the woman first up person there. Up was this young man here. Uh, uh, he I'm sorry, because I not yeah. turning my head that way. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I had a question. I was um, having a conversation with uh, some of my students in my class, and we were wondering why war was going on, etc. And I found that we looked into some money that was being spent in war, and it was a lot. So we came to the conclusion that war will never end until peace becomes more profitable. And I'm wondering if you guys believe that too. <laughs> It's a good question. I'll give it to you first. I learned something. The more we sweat for peace, the less we bleed in war. So it's time to invest in our life, in our peace. And when we speak about you know, the military, because peacekeeping forces is needed. But for me as a medical doctor, it looks like palliative care Mm. just to keep the situation, we need to put an end to the conflict and the people to resume a normal life. And in order to have that, I think it needs the world to have just one color for justice, to act immediately when there is a conflict in any part of the world. And I am sure it proved they acted and they prevented many conflicts in this world when they proacted or intervened in these conflicts. But it depends, as you said, on politics and their own interest. You see in Syria, in Libya, they engaged immediate, and they stopped it. In Syria, why not? In Afghanistan, they intervene. In Iraq, so it depends upon the political interest, and it's our responsibility. When you speak about the public, it's the public. Who is the public? It's we. So we should speak out the more we invest in putting an end to conflicts, the less we will suffer. But it's not invested. What does this world need? The food and the education of our world is less than how much do we invest in military equipment and technology. And that's what they are doing. But they want to keep it. And that's what is happening, lack of justice in this world. Justice has one color. If we want to intervene in this country, the same color we have to intervene in other places, not to wait just for peacekeeping forces. The Prime Minister of Cyprus at one point said that one of the reasons that nobody's helping us a whole lot more is that we only have olive oil. <laughs> uh, can there be money in peace, Samantha? Um, Look, I think that we underestimate every day the extent to which we are heavily financially invested in the machinery of war. And, uh, and I'll give you exa an example here. How many of you in this room either collect CPP, Canada Pension, or have paid into Canada Pension over the past couple of years? I see a few gray hairs in the audience, so, and the rest of you are being audited just like me. But, um, you know, the Canadian Pension Plan Investment Board has more than $200 million invested in the world's top 100 arms manufacturers, as does virtually every single teacher's provincial, provincial pension fund in this country. 
And so, uh, you know, we cannot talk about investing in peace when we are profiting also on the back end of war. Um, and it's astonishing to me that even though Canada has, for example, signed the Cluster Munitions Treaty, we haven't signed the Arms Trade Treaty, which we really should, need to, must, um, but that yet we, we sign these things and, and still our public pension funds were, were profiting from their sale and from their manufacturing, for example. So yes, I mean, in, in principle, you know, it makes good sense for us to invest in peace. Ultimately, um, <clears throat> ultimately we are all better for it. Uh, if you believe, if you subscribe to those kinds of economic uh, arguments that free markets, sorry, <clears throat> free markets will save us all, <clears throat> then, um, you know, then, then having more countries that are peaceful and stable that will allow you to expand those markets and create uh, income generating opportunities, that will uh, help us all. But unfortunately, right now, we have more skin in the other game, and, uh, and that is the sad truth. John Dallaire. Three years ago, there was a vote of a bill uh, as part of the uh, budget bill where um, uh, we were going to provide a fair amount of money in the millions uh, to uh, the agriculture industry, particularly the Western, to assist them in doing more research in turning uh, corn and so on uh, into ethanol so that we could use that uh, to fuel our vehicles. Um, when it went through uh, the, the Senate, um, uh, there was only one vote against uh, the concept of using food to fuel our vehicles. Uh, and that was my vote. Because I cannot ethically consider that I am prepared to see food or our ability to produce food uh, to be used to feed our vehicles when there are people dying of lack of food, of no food at all. So, so let's, let's start at home uh, before we hit the, 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 uh, the industry. Secondly, um, a few years ago, I was asked by a young boy, uh, are there still nuclear weapons? Uh, and so I looked into it and I found a pugwash, uh, or I found the town of Pugwash in Nova Scotia, where the first uh, work was done on armed, uh, nuclear arms, non-proliferation, and reduction. And so um, when I look at the environment and I look at nuclear weapons, uh, 12 or 13 of those big ones could wipe out the whole planet. We've got 27,000 of them still out there. We have invested hundreds of billions of dollars in the Western world in modernizing nuclear weapons, which is an affront to our human security, to our human right to security, yet we haven't put hundreds of billions of dollars in the environment. So we're very bicephal when we look at that. And so there's an argument to say that, that we got a few things not really well thought out in that regard, particularly in a totally useless weapon system like nuclear weapons that only continues to destabilize uh, the world uh, as it's, the proliferation keeps on going. But the third one I want to do again is bring it home because the, the arms industry is an easy target to go after and it's got an extraordinary lobby and all that stuff. A couple of days ago, we lost three RCMP cops. Before we start telling other people that they shouldn't be having weapons and we shouldn't be proliferating weapons and we should be pushing peace, I think the day that in this country we can have policemen walking around the streets that don't have to be armed to the teeth might be a good example to start with. And so if we can't prove that in our own society we need people to provide us with that sense of security without arming them massively and increasing the armament of that, then we got a real serious problem in telling other people that they got to find a way to have peace. And so let's start at home. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your participation and attention today. Um, we must move on. Mother Courage must move in this afternoon. And thank you so much to all of our panelists today. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Dr. Abulesh, Dr. Nutt, and General Dallaire. Uh, that was not simply um, incredibly informative. It was moving and it was inspiring. Um, 
This is one of over 200 events that are part of the forum. Last week we had uh, Marin Enshi with us. That was an incredible morning. Next week on Father's Day, we're, I'm going to be part of a panel along with Colin Fiore and Scott Wentworth talking about how our, under, how our uh, experiences as fathers informed our understanding of King Lear. <laughs> on the same topic of Mother Courage, at the end of the month, we're going to have a film festival. There'll be a film uh, there called Much Ado in Mostar, which is about uh, a group of young people putting on Much Ado About Nothing in ethnically and religiously divided Bosnia. And the creator of the film will be there. On June 22nd, again related to Mother Courage, we're going to have retired General John uh, de Chastelain, historian uh, Terpstra, talking about the impact of long-term wars, long-term conflicts, like the Thirty Years' War that is at the center of uh, Mother Courage and the First World War and the impact upon uh, populations. This has been live streamed, as I said. It will be on our website. Please tell your friends about it. Tell them to come to Stratford. The Playbill has so much to say. These plays are about the world we live in today. And so let's get together and benefit from the hard-won knowledge of those who came before us. Thank you for coming. And one more thing, our guests will be in the lobby now to sign books and tell you more about the foundation. So in the front lobby, thank you.